Hey, Ms. Dr. Max Marculis. Sorry, I don't want to block our, our great speakers. Uh, I'm the research director at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Uh, thank you all for coming. We're really excited to offer you this amazing panel uh, as part of our Ward Council series, which is intended to bring you access to leading experts to help better understand uh, contemporary events in the field of strategic studies. And the panel we have for you today is particularly uh, relevant. Uh, it's titled Cyber Operations in Modern Warfare, Ukraine and Beyond. So this is going to be a great opportunity to hear from our panelists on the changing nature of warfare, uh, the, to what extent has cyber played a role in the Russia-Ukraine war? Has it been more or less of one than we've expected? What does that tell us? Well, what does the role of cyber in Ukraine tell us about the future of large-scale combat operations? Uh, we are very excited to be working with the Army Cyber Institute on this. Uh, so we have five speakers today. They're each going to provide a few minutes of context on their particular area of expertise. And then we'll be opening it up to question and answers. So we're going to have lots of time to hear from you. And they are very happy to, uh, to answer any questions you have at all about any part of their research, um, any parts, any, anything to help you better understand the conflict in Ukraine or cyber more generally. So... Without further ado, I will uh, introduce our panelists. We have uh, speaking first is going to be, well, actually, I guess I'll go in order of how we're sitting, so um, in case people can't read the, the name names. But uh, first, we have Captain and Dr. Maggie Smith, uh, a research scientist at Army Cyber Institute and an assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences. Uh, we then have Dr. Erica Lonergan. Uh, she is a um, assistant professor at the Army Cyber Institute, also uh, a, are you also teaching in social science? Yeah, great. Also uh, teaching in, in the Department of Social Science. Uh, we then have Dr. Gavin Wild, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, Dr. Brandon Valeriano, distinguished senior fellow at Marine Corps University and a senior advisor to the Cyberspace uh, Solarium Commission 2.0, correct? And then uh, we also have Dr. Grace Mueller, a research fellow at the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, so, we're very grateful to have them, and I believe Dr. Lonergan is going to start us off. Yeah, great. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. So I'm really excited to have uh, this panel. Um, I'm going to kick it off by offering some sort of general framing thoughts on what the key assumptions about cyber and the role that it would play in the lead up to this conflict, and then um, you know, talk a bit about how each of these assumptions were not quite right or didn't say that a lot of people thought they would, and then um, offer some brief questions for the United States. Um, and then I'll turn it over again. So um, I have identified about, as there were indications that Russia might be seeking to invade Ukraine or conduct some type of conventional assault. Um, the first assumption was that there would be this sort of wave of cyber operations that would act um, sort of the first, you know, phase zero or phase one of the conventional campaign, that there would be some kind of cyber shock and awe that would take place. Um, and, you know, it, it's not surprising that people would hold this assumption because, um, you know, Russia is a prolific and experienced cyber actor. Um, we might expect this given their strategy and doctrine, um, but um, you know, as as what as uh, researchers and uh, private companies like Microsoft and Google and the U.S. government and others have reported and discussed since then, and that there would be this kind of wave of um, disruptive, maybe even destructive cyber attacks um, as a way of shaping the battlefield prior to a conventional invasion didn't. For some, uh, some wiper malware, there was the Viasat, there were some disruptive um, DDoS attacks and website defacement and things like that, but nothing that was sort of approximating the cyber shock and awe that was expected. So that's assumption one. Assumption, you know, as we shifted into subsequent phases of the campaign, you know, um, that we would expect. Uh, in the beginning, we would perhaps expect to see sort of closely, co uh, if not perfectly integrated, cyber operations on the battlefield take place in 
tandem with or in support of kinetic operation. Um, you know, I would caveat this one to say that there's been a lot of academic research, especially analyzing the 2014 uh, Russian annexation of Crimea, that's demonstrated that Russia is actually not so great at doing that type of battlefield coordination. Um, but yet there was still a lot of talk that perhaps you would expect to see this. Um, and as the conflict is still ongoing, um, there has been reporting uh, from, you know, uh, particularly from the tech firms like Microsoft, and I don't mean to call them that so much, but um, but they've, you know, they've done, they've published a number of different reports on assessing the role of cyber and Ukraine conflict um, that shows, you know, uh, a correlation between things that take place and actions that take place in the virtual space, but it's actually really difficult to establish a causal relationship or a deliberate coordination between cyber operations um, in the virtual space and kinetic operations. So we haven't seen that yet. Um, a third assumption, um, and this is one certainly that a lot of people, both in the private sector and in the US government, uh, held or espoused, was that Russia would conduct cyber attacks against the United States or against our allies and partners in NATO, um, especially in response to increasingly severe uh, Western sanctions regimes or other types of diplomatic actions or statements. Um, and to th this was um, such a strongly held assumption that the U.S. government took the unprecedented step of, um, and the Department of Homeland Security did this through CISA, um, initiating this new campaign called Shields Up, where before, without any sort of specific indicators of specific Russian, CISA launched this campaign warning the private sector and sending letters to um, board of directors warning them to sort of put their proverbial shields up in cyberspace and there was likely to be an impending Russian uh, attack against American critical infrastructure and maybe against their allies and partners. Um, and this was another assumption that didn't really materialize. Um, there have been some sort of disruptive DDoS attacks that I know Maggie will probably talk about when we talk about the actors, but um, but nothing um, along the along the lines of what um, a lot of people and experts in U.S. government. So that was that Russia might wield cyber power as an independent instrument of coercion during an actual conflict. So distinct from sort of um, operating in tandem with or in parallel with particular units on the ground. Um, you know, we've seen in the past Russia do things like, you know, conduct a site up, launch a cyber attack against Ukrainian critical infrastructure, which did in 15 to take out a power grid, sort of independently of other things that were going on. So maybe we, we would expect to see this type of activity too. Um, and it turns out we haven't really seen that either, right? There were reports about Sandworm uh, trying to um, uh, attempt to take out uh, a power uh, infrastructure in Ukraine during the conflict, but they weren't quite. Um, and then the fifth assumption, and then I'll, I'll wrap up quickly, um, is that uh, there's sort of this general assumption that cyberspace is often stopped, right? And I think this assumption feeds a lot of the other assumptions that were Russia specific, right? The idea that cyber operations are relatively easy, they offer low barriers to threat actors to have um, you know, significant strategic effects, and that's really hard to defend against cyber attacks. But actually, with Ukraine, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of evidence in support of the value of the defense, right? Um, we've seen the US, uh, US Cyber Command conduct, conduct hunt forward cyber operations in anticipation of Russian um, threat activity in cyberspace, which reportedly has been um, effective. We've seen the private sector step in and offer up um, cybersecurity support to Ukrainian defenders. Well, experts in and outside of Ukraine have credited a lot of those, not to mention the Ukrainians themselves, significantly improving their own defenses. Um, and so, and so that you know, a lot of people have credited all of those collective defensive efforts with thwarting a potentially more significant Russian um, Russian uh, activity. So, really quickly, uh, what from any one case, uh, we don't know what we know. But that said. Um, I think that we need to um, have some humility in uh, learning for our own uh, force. Uh, um, not when it comes to the conventional battle space, because there, there are legitimate reasons to think ex ante that 
um, Russia would fail along numerous dimensions, and it did. But in cyber, Russia is a demonstrated, sophisticated actor. Let's not forget it was responsible for solar winds, uh, sophisticated supply chain breach uh, for the 2016. Integrating cyber into conventional warfare um, should make us kind of pause and think about some of our own assumptions about how we anticipate operating. Um, I also think that uh, it reminds us that we can't take the goodwill of the private sector for granted. Um, the private sector has been a force for good in many ways in Ukraine. Uh, we don't know what that may look like in a future conflict. Um, we should be wary of threat inflation. Uh, there's a lot of that going on. I'm happy to talk about that more in Q&A. And then finally, um, I think cyber deterrence isn't dead, even though lots of people have tried to kill it over the years. Um, Russia has clearly been deterred from conducting cyber attacks against the United States and NATO. It's been deliberate in how it targets. Um, and I, I think that we shouldn't, uh, I think we should circumspection the idea that cyber deterrence doesn't work, um, especially um, at high pressure. So I talked for way too long. Let me turn it over to Gavin. Thank you, Erica. Um, I first want to say how honored I am to be uh, on sharing the panel with such esteemed uh, colleagues. One slight correction, uh, uh, however smart I may think myself, I am not, in fact, a doctor, only a mister. So um, just for the record. Um, so I think I will follow up on uh, some of those core assumptions. My research thus far at Carnegie has looked at what are the Russia's specific facets of why those expectations that Eric outlined uh, may have gone unmet. And one of the major, before I go through those, a major thing I'll start off with is the need to understand how Russia, or rather the Kremlin, uh, has historically and continues to conceptualize cyber, quote unquote. Um, Russia takes a much more holistic view of the, of the information space uh, as a domain under which offensive cyber operations are but one component. I would say a broad, in, Sweeping generalities, Russia's conception of the information space starts from the cognitive out rather than the U.S. or Western conception, which tends to start at the network level out. And so when you start there, um, a lot of these assumptions will, will make a little bit more sense. Uh, number one, um, Russia's much of the, the preponderance of Russia's cyber capacity, if you look at the units that we are aware of, I'm thinking GRU unit 54777 or SVR's LIMS or the Center 18, they put a lot of stock in the idea that cyber enabled information operations can somehow alter the consciousness of a target country's leadership, a target country's uh, populace, and uh, they have an inherent sense of information's eminent wieldability in a way that I, I think is probably overestimated uh, on their part and is underestimated on ours because we don't, I think we don't generally appreciate the degree to which the Kremlin assumes that um, everything is an information operation. Reality itself is an information operation um, and that there's no such thing as kind of emergent public sentiment. Um, so they dump a lot, when we think about the rice bowl of available cyber talent and technology and capability within the Russian system. Um, assume that a bigger chunk than we tend to appreciate of that dedicated towards altering minds, not disrupting networks. So starting from there, um, one of the first things that a lot of people think of, well, does Russia have a cyber command analog? And the answer is yes, kind of. Um, and so rewinding to 2008, in the aftermath of the Georgia incursion, a lot of the introspection in Moscow went toward the fact that not only was, did Georgia prove resilient in the technical cyber domain, uh, in that they were able to kind of uh, shift a lot of their domains to safer domains, uh, migrate a lot of their backup and holdings to uh, outside, outside of their territory, thereby kind of adding some defensive layers, but also they remain pretty resilient at being able to speak with their own populace and the narratives about the, the incursion into Georgia were deeply unfriendly to Moscow globally. That prompted a great deal of introspection in Moscow and got a lot of people talking about the need for Moscow to have a much more integrated command style structure to handle information operations. By 2014, that idea had matured to the point where 
the general staff, eighth directorate had started going on the hunt, quote unquote, for folks with technical backgrounds, English speaking backgrounds, uh, to try to put together uh, what would become known as the Information Operations Troops, or VIO as a shorthand in Russian. So the VIO essentially, uh, for public reporting, um, essentially got stood up around 2014, 2015. They exercised in the 2016 Kavkaz exercises for a lot of public reporting. There were 12 to 14 companies of maybe 14, 15 troops apiece doing things from counter propaganda to disinformation operations, et cetera. But the preponderance of what we can find in open source about this uh, unit was that it was primarily focused on counter propaganda. Again, drawing back to that idea that the moldability of public uh, conception of, of war, of wartime activity was the, the purpose. Um, and so fast forward to today, uh, through a, a series of leaks, as well as sanctions by the US Treasury, we're now aware that unit 55111 is the VIO under which the GRU's 72nd, uh, which has runs a lot of disinformation outlets like InfoRoss, et cetera, apparently falls under that command structure. So it remains an open question whether the cyber command analog is merely a bunch of GRU units wrapped in a military command wrapper, uh, the degree to which the command structure differs during peacetime versus wartime, all of those remain open questions. Uh, but what I would emphasize is that the degree to which there is an analog to U.S. Cyber Command it is probably emphasizing uh, what the U.S. terms information operations uh, to a greater degree than we might appreciate. Uh, secondly, with regard to the Russian services, including the GRU, the FSB, the SVR, the preponderance of Russian cyber capacity seems dedicated towards in intelligence gathering and subversion. And the question, as Erica kind of outlined, is the, the degree to which there's surge capacity to support a military command set of operations on a compressed timeline like the one we saw since 24 February, um, with the degree of control of fires that are required during a uh, combined arms campaign, and with the efficacy that you would need to have the kind of impact that it uh, during a period of conventional conflict needs to be much greater than that, merely kind of throwing pebbles in Kyiv's shoes uh, that it's tried to do since 2014. And so the other thing I would highlight as well is something that author Max Smeets kind of talks about is that latent knowledge, that uh, tacit understanding of target networks that is the remit and purview of intelligence agencies like the GRU, the FSB, the SVR. It is really not easy to transfer over for actioning to a military command unit. Um, that proved, seems to have been the case uh, in the Ukraine incursion. I think it probably remains the case in the U.S. system as well, uh, which certainly underscores the need for what I think um, has been termed persistent engagement and defend forward. Your, your actual military commands need to be exercising on target and engaged on target. It's not enough to just say the GRU or the FSB or whoever will just hand over for fresh targets or fresh exploits, particularly in the case of the FSB and the GRU and the Russian. So much enmity and rivalry dating back a long time, even to the breakup of the KGB in the early 90s. That rivalry persists today, and it's uh, that adds an extra layer of complexity because there's certainly a lot of uh, jealous guarding of rice bowls to the extent that I would highly doubt that the FSB would be willing or able to hand that over to um, a military command at all. Um, and the only entity in Moscow that's capable of kind of arbitrating those rivalries is the Russian Security Council. And there, even there, you have the same kind of political drivers that don't lend themselves well to the kind of military decision making that you uh, certainly seen since 24 February. Um, and then lastly, I would just note that in Russian information warfare theorizing and doctrine, the initial period of war is crucial. It's everything. That's where your fires in both cognitively and technologically have to be at their most overwhelming. Well, as we saw with the incursion into Ukraine, uh, the planning slapdash and closely held 
which means that that crucial piece of information warfare thought essentially got swept under the rug. Uh, and so for those reasons, I think in particular, I, I would offer as unique facets of Russian thinking that led to the kind of uh, unrealized uh, capabilities that we uh, expected to see uh, from Russia, uh, notwithstanding the fact that they have been and remain a uh, very capable cyber adversary writ large, However, in the in the context of a conventional arms campaign, it's proven less than capable. I'll turn it over to you. Or Maggie, I'm sorry. You're good. Um, hi, everyone. Especially to the faculty, because students, I know that you got some instructor points out of coming, possibly, or doing this instead of class. But being here, um, I'm going to talk about the irregulars. This war shown the power of third-party actors and can these bring them out of the woodwork and decide that they're going to play a role. Um, we have seen conflict. So how many of you have heard of Anonymous? Hacker girl luck, right? Okay, so Anonymous came out really early in the UK. A lot of hackers that are given safe harbor within the state of Russia, they kind of turn a blind eye to cyber activities and they have this unstated rule that you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't mess with anything that Russia controls. If you don't create any harm within Russia, then you're good to go. And created a similar like minded group to what we see in Ukraine called the Ukraine IT Army. So I have recently. Uh, telegram channels, and one of them is for Killnet, which is the Russian hacker group. And thankfully, you can translate Russian in Telegram. It's not great. I don't get the nuances. That's what we have. Olivia. <laughs> the initial invasion or the opening salvo in February that. Their real impact is exactly what Gavin was talking about. It's in the cognitive space. In articles recently on Killnet in the news, it's been around. If you Google Killnet, which you can do now if you want to, um, you'll a few things will pop up. One will come up that they attacked U.S. airports. So the killer thing here is that they attacked the website of U.S. airports. So for anyone who's traveled, how many of you actually go to like? JFK's website or LaGuardia's website. No, you're going to go to Delta, American Airlines, or whatever. <laughs> <It's so strange. laughs> so this impacted you for maybe 15 minutes, right? But they they do that. They do a distributed denial of service. They vector some of their bots that they've set up through Telegram, and they shut down U.S. websites. On the second day where they had this doing at the outset of October, they went after all of the VA's like, veterans beneficiary website. So you can go to the TRICARE website and had it fail. You want to use TRICARE? Yeah. TRICARE was low one morning. Um, and they also did, uh, I forget, but it, it was 3 a.m. Eastern time. So they were doing this at like 9 a.m. their time. Here. So I'm not sure. Yeah, unless I have no idea. They think maybe if an opening, they'll get into sick call that day. Um, <laughs> yet the U.S. media is still paying attention to them, and I think and not based in research, just from these observations through this conflict, is that and we've been so smashed by Russian cyber attacks. Not Pegya was huge. Um, Solar Winds is huge. And then we had this whole mess of an election. We know that they're active. We with us in our democracy and our democratic institutions, as well as all of our systems. They just like to make life kind of uncomfortable for us here, and they do a pretty good job of that in many cases. Um beginning that they're good at cyber. And so we have this expectation, like what Eric was talking about, 
that we're going to see shock and awe, that we're going to see these big things that really have an impact. Erica's assumptions that you laid out that we have this threat inflation going on. So that's something that we've been really interested in and in looking at with regards to illness. <laughs> on the Ukraine side, there is the Ukraine IT army, which is causing headaches and some concern amongst cyber professionals and especially our military cyber leaders, because all of a sudden we have third party patients within the state of Russia at like a resistance where all of those people are coming from. And unlike Killnet, which is pretty ad hoc, they're kind of a broke club um, in the language is pretty dirty. The Ukraine IT army is much more systematic, professional. They release their targets on a daily basis at 9 a.m. Central European time, which is about um, 3 a.m. here. But, and then it's produced in Ukrainian first and then English after. And then there's a list of targets that's with an objective. So at the outset of the war, I was thrilled to see that they had these weekend themes, one of which was basically to take down the, the Russian equivalent of Grubhub. So can you imagine on a weekend not being able to order food? Like that's what they were going after, making life uncomfortable. They also took offline the ability to order movie tickets because it's all centralized by the state. And it was on a Saturday night that they did this. Um, so it's a and quality of life to make things uncomfortable and to bring the fact that there's a conflict home to their their people and um and so those types of motivations are unlike things that we've seen before in terms of third party actors. we always have had a lot of criminal activity we've always had different sorts of terrorist organizations having an impact in their cyberspace and for the past 20 years what u.s cyber command has really looked at is how cyber can contribute to the ct fighter counterterrorism. So this is something that's interesting in state directed. This is a group of volunteers. The nation state is aware of it, but not complicit or directing what they target. And yet they're having an impact in the conflict in both the cognitive as well as the, this, um, I was gonna say the cyberspace, but it was the cyberspace. Uh, so those things are really fascinating to me. And uh, that's really what I've been focusing on for the most part. So ultimately, because our, our world is so interconnected, mutually assured destruction, right? We were nuclear powers. We knew we needed a first strike capability. We held that atomic weapons and nuclear bombs were decisive on the battlefield. We saw that in World War II with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When started in 2010, it was placed under, as a sub-unified command under U.S. cyber, excuse me, under U.S. Strategic Command. Strategic Command is the one that controls our nuclear weapons. So it was viewed as a weapon very risky to use. And Dr. Lana Van has done a ton of research on cyber escalation, which is something you should ask for question. And since then, in 2018, it got elevated to a fully, and it's now a four-star command, and we're seeing the world in a different paradigm. It's the paradigm of interconnectedness. Everybody, everybody. And so this means that this is to the geographic boundaries of the nation of Ukraine, right? We see it in the cognitive space. Kill the American people because the media is sensationalizing them. They are also having an impact cognitively on those people that are in that Telegram channel because they cheer themselves on, even though they maybe took TRICARE 45 more seconds longer to load than before. But they're stoked about it because the American media mentioned it, right? They're, that's kind of this energizing um, thing that they get out of the press here. And that interconnectedness is playing a big role in the conflict here, in the cognitive space that exists outside of the direct to watch and um, try to talk about it more, but stop there. Over to Grace. All right, Dr. Grace. Um, I'm going to be kind of adding to everything we've already been discussing. It's kind of a seamless conversation, but I'm going to contribute by kind of describing what we can learn about Russia's interactions with Ukraine from the past 20 years and how that relates to the current situation um, right now in Ukraine. Like Russia's interactions with Ukraine from 2000 to 2020, and then five more takeaways. And as you'll see, they're kind of common things that we've been talking about. Um, so, 
this past cyber behavior um, targeting Ukraine. Um, one takeaway is that Russia is frequently the initiator and rarely the target. Uh, of 30 reported cyber incidents between 2000 and 2020, Russia initiated 28 of those, or 93%. Um, so you see Ukraine. Um, second, most of those attacks were launched for disruption purposes rather than degradative purposes. Um, typically, these are just kind of phishing attempts or DDoS attacks. And as kind of Maggie was saying, they're kind of just messing with um, kind of Ukrainian uh, websites that are over there. Um, third, kind of related to that, cyber incidents in the past were not very severe. Um, on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of severity, they never surpassed a scale of five, which is kind of um, single critical network infiltration or physical attempted destruction. So rarely are they physical attempts. Um, fourth, right, we're still dealing with kind of past interactions. Uh, private sectors and government and local actors are frequently targeted, more so, more so than military actors. Um, in fact, just 11% of targets were military actors in the last year. Um, and Discussing, there is um, a good amount of information, uh, cyber enabled information operations. About one third of the past interactions could be labeled that um, uh, for the purpose of manipulating information. Um, in many ways, the current situation in Ukraine is kind of just a continuation of these behaviors rather than a departure. Uh, first, we have, however, seen an increase in the number of total cyber attacks. And this is research that Brandon and I have been doing looking at the early months of the war, uh, there has been an increase in the number of cyber attacks, but there wasn't an increase in severity. If anything, the severity just kind of stayed the same. Um, therefore, there's little evidence that kind of it's a dramatic cyber war that many were predicting. The cyber objectives in Ukraine, um, in many ways, they are continuing to be disruptive rather than degradative. Again, this was something that people thought would change because we're in this physical war. But again, we see these disruption um, attacks not necessarily kind of causing long-term. Um, one Microsoft report put it like this, said the bomb, like the bombers in 1940, some of the cyber attacks have succeeded, but at a broader level, these attacks have failed strategically and stable Ukraine's defensive. We have seen the strong defensive mechanism in Ukraine. Uh, third, and we're talking about currently the current war, um, the targets are still predominantly private actors or government and local entities. They're not military actors. Um, again, that military actors are not more frequently targeted is something that has been surprising, especially for those in the cyber field. Um, related to that, we have seen limited multi-domain operations. So kinetic with cyber, we have that. There was a lot of kind of talk at the beginning of this war, especially in February and March, that there would be kind of this huge wave of these kind of uh, multi-domain operations. But in the research that Brandon and I have done, we only find about 15% in the early months of the war involved these multi-domain operations. Um, and finally, we have seen a continuation of cyber-enabled disinformation operations, uh, but these aren't dramatically everywhere. Um, that's not to undermine what's going on currently in Ukraine, as often these are uh, the purpose of these is to sow panic among the public and mistrust in authorities. Um, so you can see kind of telegram channels being taken over kind of spreading disinformation. So those shouldn't be discredited, but by and large, there's not been a ton of it compared to kind of these disruptive attacks. Um, kind of overall takeaways, there has been a dramatic increase in the number, actual quantity of cyber attacks, uh, but there has not been a shift in severity, style, or targets during the war. So we're kind of just seeing uh, Russia going back to its tried and true patterns. And over its framework. Great, thank you. Uh, voice back. I haven't done this in a while. It's been a long pandemic. I used to have a booming voice, but I don't know. Still there. Uh, I'll try and wrap up some things and kind of lead us to you know where we want to go in terms of a period. Uh, overall, we're looking at escalation here. The war is what it is. The war has already begun. There's not much we can really do. Question is, is it going to expand? Is it going to get worse in intensity? And one thing we need to discuss is what exactly is escalation? And I think a lot of people who promote the idea that the war will be escalatory never really define the basic term. And escalation in its most abstract sense is vertical or horizontal. 
distillation either goes vertically more severe in the case in Ukraine, or it would draw on other parties and attack other states. And that's been the big fear that they would start to attack the EU, that they would attack the United States. There have been some other European attacks going on lately. It's not clear if they're connected, but we have not seen escalation in the way many people thought, either in terms of the increase in severity with it and attacks to other states throughout the world. But the deeper epistemological question is how would we know if there is escalation if there was escalation? And that's a big challenge we have. CISA, uh, part of DHS, the cyber, I always forget the name, cyber <laughs> infrastructure, security. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's CISA. Yeah, um, they they recently said that they want to cyber attacks, and you know, my clip is, what would you make that? Where would that come from? If you're going to do some sort of DHS style, you know, uh, terrorism threat alert system, how would you know it when you see it? And that's a big pathology we have in the United States and globally. We don't really have a great conception of data or metrics in this space. And if we want to get better at the defense and we want to get better at anticipating cyber operations, we need to get better at collecting data so that we know when the canary dies in the coal mine. We need to know these sorts of indicators, but this is not something we've done very well as a community. We have an extensive capability in the United States to produce data. We don't have that extensive capability extended to the gray zone, and that's fairly troubling. Now, Grace went over, uh, Dr. Muller, I'm sorry, but she got her, she, congratulations, she got her PhD a few months ago. Um, <laughs> a number of data points as to why there is no cyber escalation in Ukraine. Everyone in this room is why. What are you going to make your bet about? What, do you, what is your theory? What is your hypothesis? And there are a number of ideas. There are a number of theories. Uh, Eric and I have worked for a long time on. Um, a lot of people have suggested that cyberspace has become offense ascendant. Now they're shifting to suggest that cyberspace is truly defensive ascendant. So it could be that the defenses are better than we ever thought they would be. Um, there's another corollary kind of idea that uh, there, there really are better tools. There are better capabilities just that Russia saving them. Saving them for what? I don't know. But there's this idea that there's a bigger war, there's a bigger battle to fight, and that one day Russia will really show up. I also saw another uh, reporter mention this issue recently where they said, um, not Petia was a very significant attack. Russia should have saved that for the Ukraine war. Uh, not that day, it was in 2017. Uh, the first version of it was 2016. I clipped on Twitter that it would have graduated college and got a master's degree. This <laughs> you can't save these capabilities and assume that you can leverage them at the time you need when you want them to work. And that's really the challenge that Russia is really going through is that all the extensive planning, all the extensive exercises they've done up until this point, when it really mattered, they failed. And the question is, why did they fail? The last idea could be just that Russia's just really bad at this. That Russia just really sucks and we have overestimated it. I'm not sure what the answer is. And that's what's so interesting about cyberspace is that there are a lot of unanswered questions. But what we don't want to do is continue the news cycle of punditry where there's nothing but guesswork and prognostication. We need data, we need evidence, we need case studies, we need war games, we need experiments, we need to leverage all aspects of social science to understand these questions because these issues are so critically important for us to understand that we cannot leave it to the people who have a vested interest in this domain to articulate the domain. And what I'm suggesting is that the majority of people who speak in the press are from cyber threat intelligence companies. That would be like every time there's a war, you just go to Boeing and Northrop and say, hey, how's this war going? It doesn't really make sense, yet that's what happens in cyberspace. And that's what's really concerning about this entire kind of ecosystem. There was an expectation for revolution. 
there was an expectation for dramatic change. And I can tell you my life would be so much easier if I were to say there's cyber war here, it's changing our lives, there's a revolution in warfare, everything's different. But that's not what's been going on for the last 30 years. And we do have a revolution in warfare. It's called the precision strike complex. It's been there since the 90s. HIMARS are a developed weapon from the late 90s. These things have been there for a long time. It's not cyber. It's not AI. It's not the quantum. We need to not let oh, the fantasies of how we want war to operate overtake the reality. And that's where we are right now. The question is, what is cyber good for? A lot of people thought it'd be an interesting way to destroy command and control, an interesting way to coerce the opposition, an interesting way to attack cognitively the opposition. But all these ideas are guesswork unless you evaluate your bets. Anytime you make a bet, you want to evaluate that bet. You want to know if the Bills won or lost. You want to know if the Astros are going to win the World Series. It's not a hypothetical. Yet everything we do in cyberspace generally is a hypothetical when there is a long train of historical reality that we often ignore because it doesn't meet our expectations. And it's sad to say that war is not going to be some future kind of dramatic change like Battlestar Galactica where the enemies come in and disable the adversary. The reality is Ukraine, before the war started, they built wire systems to communicate in trenches like World War I. And because they did things like that, because they built in redundancy, they survived. And we need to learn that lesson and really evaluate what they've done here to figure out what's going to happen in the future. But it shouldn't be based on guesswork. And that's the challenge we need to Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as somebody who knows almost nothing about the cyber domain, that was an extremely interesting. It's very interesting. Lots of uh, lots of great things to think about for people like I don't have that background, and and I feel like I have a much better sense about how to think about cyber contact or contemporary conflict. Uh, we have roughly thirty minutes for Q and A. I'm going to ask the first question, and then if anybody else has a question, please just raise your hand and I will call on you. So my first question is, um, international like, arms transfers and aid have played a big role in how it, um, on the battlefield. Have we seen a similar role for partnership and um, alliance and assistance in the cyber? Yeah. Operation right before the outset of the war would be um, back in 2021, U.S. Cyber Command, specifically the Cyber National Mission Force, sent support to Ukraine. And the hunt forward operations are at the request of a partner nation. All of the guys on the cyber policy team would know this because we went over it ad nauseum this weekend. So you're, if you fall asleep, it's okay. Um, but hunt forward operations are when that nation, so Ukraine invited the U.S. assets to come and visit and work with their cyber teams. And this is cyber professionals, usually majors and then a team. And they, they look at their partner networks and they see what's going on there. And so that means we can see our enemies and our adversaries working in kind of their backyard, right? Because Ukraine is Russia. Yard. And so we get to see what operations are there. We can help them identify malware, see what they may be escalating, and we can give them tips about what we've seen in our own networks or attempts that they've been making. So that was a, I think, really fruitful incursion for, of U.S. assets to help and facilitate some remediation, some hardening, and all of that. Um, and so that's one example of where coordination amongst partner nations has really been beneficial. And I think that is the whole region. Um, we've seen that with NATO partners. There's been better information sharing in those. Anyone else? I mean, I would just add very briefly to, uh, in terms of hunt forward, this isn't the first time that um, Cyber Command has conducted hunt forward operations. It's been going on for the past few years. 
Um, it's happened in partnership um, with uh, Estonia, with Montenegro, Croatia, Croatia, Slovenia. Yeah, pretty much all the Baltic. So this is this is sort of an ongoing. Um, this has been an ongoing exercise. Um, to Gavin's point, um, it's actually um, General Hartman, who's the Cyber National Mission Force Commander, did an interview recently with the BBC. I think it was. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, on the BBC website, you can read this interview. It's all back and forward. Um, and he discusses it um, um, helping to harden Ukrainian defenses, enable resilience, to gather information that can be shared with appropriate partners, you know, so on. But also as a, as a way of um, uh, almost a sort of a, a, a testing environment for our own cyber operators to become more proficient and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, which, which gets to your point, I think, about how we can't just assume that these are uh, not just capabilities, but also skills that can be turned on and off like a light switch, right? Um, and so I, I think that reinforces a couple of points we've been talking about. But it's interesting, there is a, you know, there's a debate about forward operations. Um, they're not, um, you know, the U.S. government discusses, talks about them as being defensive. Uh, but at the same time, we use language like hunt and talk about hunting prey. Right. Um, and so if I'm prey, I don't think of myself as being on the defense. Uh, right. Well, if I'm a hunter, I'm generally not on the defense. Right. So, you know, I think that um, there's some interesting debates about being, um, or how can we measure the effectiveness of these types of operations, both in their immediate impact for a particular uh, conflict, like with Ukraine, as well as longer term impact in terms of skill development. Uh, and, and also, what are some of the potential trade offs and risks? Whoop it back in. So third party act also helping. So I'm wearing my my fella. Does anyone uh, want to see the fella. fella? So my fella is Willie. <laughs> I'm gonna joke. Okay, Willie Fellison, because I love Willie Nelson. My fella looks like Willie Nelson. But um, and I don't post in on Russian propaganda sites, but um the <laughs> It's an organization, right? And it's like these, everybody makes teams. And um, when Russian diplomats or Russian public figures post on Twitter, the public swoop in and Twitter feeds um, in, in an effort to prevent them from posting propaganda. And it has caused a lot of surprisingly visceral responses from these diplomats and these public figures because all of a sudden there's just like a flurry of Shiba Inu their feeds and um, and it's quite a community and they talk about it, they convene almost every night. And so that's an international cohort of people from all over the place that make a fella and then make memes and then spam Russian propaganda. And so that's an, a third party actor that's having an impact in the cognitive space and causing a lot of disruption for the Russian diplomats that are trying to share the Russian narrative, uh, which is primarily sensationalized or false. Thank you. I was wondering, um, from Russian practices and cyber practices and their policies, what's something that we can learn? One thing that I think people might suggest that we leverage is that Russia has been very good at leveraging their criminal enterprises in cyberspace. And uh, the fact is, the United States has been doing that forever. I mean, Microsoft, all these prominent organizations are full of these former hackers who are caught doing things when they're 15 and get converted into the community. So, it's not like one's better than the other, but the difference is that we have an adherence to law and order that doesn't exactly apply to Russia. And that's not something we want to emulate. That's not something we want to encourage. That enables chaos and that um, kind of blurs the lines too much. So I'm not so sure there's anything we want to emulate from Russia, basically because they fail spectacularly. And we will continue to be about I'm excited for our future of history because uh, 
episodes where everything goes so totally wrong. <laughs> I'll say I I like that the U.S. seems to be moving in towards a space of thinking about cyber and information operations more holistically. I would say that logical coherence lends itself better, certainly than than to success than perhaps um, having them separate has done for us. Uh, I would say an area that we ought not try to emulate is going toe to toe with them, uh, sock puppet accounts, and, and for lack of a better term, shit posting uh, kind of driven in a campaign that we outsource to contractors. Um, we're just not that good at it. And frankly, I've said here, I don't think they are either. We, our media ecosystem just tends to put um, a lot more kind of uh, stake how effective these ops are simply by dint of the fact that we can see them. And I think that's one thing that to, to bear in mind. We can see Russian intent very well. We can see their attempts very well in IO. The preponderance of that visibility, however, does not translate to efficacy, only in as much as I think we kind of buy into the myth making. And I think that's a, a dynamic that we have to be mindful of. Acknowledging Russia's holistic view of the information space without subscribing to the notion that human consciousness or societies writ large are simply moldable and wieldable with enough clicks and likes and retweets because clearly that's not the case. Yeah. Jump on there. Um, one thing that we can, you know, for comparing the United States with Russia, that's made by these cyber attacks. And if we're thinking about Ukraine and Russia, like in the last in the current war, none of the cyber incidents have led to concessions made on the behalf of Ukraine. Whereas with the United States, we don't launch as many cyber attacks or initiate as frequently as Russia, but when we do, some of these are more successful at concession. So it's kind of, I don't know if we need to be noisy. It's like when we choose to kind of enter in that space, we can kind of get things done. Uh, kind of something that came out from my meetings. Points from the A4. So I know it was mentioned um, about cyber attacks that have say with DDoSing websites, which is like air or <laughs> airport websites. Um, I was wondering what panel take was on say more steep active within the cyber domain that Russia is understanding, such as um, misinformation and disinformation um, campaigns within uh, American society. Or, for example, how the FCC is considering banning TikTok um, due to the security concerns involved with American uh, American search warrant. I love the TikTok thing. It's like, oh my God, we're going to learn all our dances. <laughs> what, what are we going to do next? Um, I think what's really interesting for this area, and that's something to encourage you guys to look into. And I'm going to start a paper on this is, uh, and it goes back to the other question, what should we not emulate? We should not emulate Russia's tendency to exasperate uh, racial divisions within states. And that tendency in uh, information operations to me is really fascinating. And I really want to dive down and explore that. But in cybersecurity, we've done a very poor job in uh, developing the differences between ethnicities, racial groups, and gender, and I think we need to do better at that. So that's that's a hope for the future. Stomp with regard to the, the TikTok uh, episode, the back end availability of US person data to Chinese Communist Party notwithstanding, like the USP data is available, no one needs to steal it. It's all out there. Like so brokerages every day sell US data to entities domestically and overseas writ large. So like, I think there's a myth making about TikTok's, you know, purported ability to funnel in through the back door and steal that data. That data is already for free. You wouldn't need to spend much uh, sophisticated trade craft getting uh, direct pipe to the vast majority of USP data 
um, because it's, there's the FCC doesn't really have any, nor other, any other regulatory agency doesn't have any guardrails against anyone filtering as much of your personal data as they choose in any event. Yeah, really briefly, I just, you know, in terms of the next and disinformation campaign, um, and about, like, I, I think we also, um, we don't have really good ways of measuring their effectiveness. Um, and so I think it's important not to equate um, volume with impact necessarily. Um, and also like how we even define what it means for um, an information or influence operation to be successful um, and how we kind of trace the causal link between shaping someone's understanding of their environment and in turn then shaping their decision-making and their behavior, right? So I think there's a lot of room for, you know, for social scientific research on, on that front and how we actually measure that. And I also think a big challenge posed by this, and this gets also to Brent's point about exacerbating existing tensions, um, you know, we have a challenge in that uh, it's it's easier for us to talk about the adversaries without, right, um, rather than the challenges within. Um, and there wouldn't be uh, a Russian and Chinese and other, um, you know, adversarial uh, information operations would be far less successful if we did a better job at addressing our own domestic political polarization and giving fewer um, lines of of, uh, of conflict and tension for adversaries to to poke at. So um, it's not this is a challenge that we can't just solve by making the Russians go away, right? Um, Thank you. Okay, uh, Pat Sullivan, the WI director. So I'll ask Brandon, but really anybody, please comment. Um, so you suggested earlier that there is you, you can't keep an offensive cyber weapon on the shelf, uh, or if you do, there's a a shelf life that is um, measured a much smaller time scale than it would be for other offensive weapons. So as an implication of that that offensive cyber is inherently incoherent operationally and strategically speaking? I think it's more difficult than we estimate. Um, there's a lesson in some of the work of Jason Lee, who early on suggested that we had a lot more zero days than we actually did. And I think that's the myth, is that we have this arsenal ready to go. And we do to some extent, but that arsenal attributes and I find the intelligence gain loss calculation and how you might actually make that empirically, methodologically, very, very interesting. But we don't necessarily do that well. And uh, I think that's something we really need to get better at. We need to get better at operational research in the hybrid or gray space. And we do it very, very well in some areas in the military. And in other areas, it's kind of a lot of guesswork and a lot of maybe this and maybe that and to me that's just not good enough and that's one of the reasons why we don't see these operations leverage when push comes to shove because no one wants to do something that may not work you're not going to get you're not going to get your medal by doing that so that's a challenge we have to deal with moving into the future what is reality i guess won't get that in the article um Big challenge is that when you think about military campaign plans, it happens long time out. And um, in order to use that we may have stockpiled, you actually have to have access first. And so that means having the right understanding of that network. So being able to enumerate a network to be able to identify areas where you can horizontally escalate privileges and then get to an adversary device or an adversary whatever it is, and and maintaining that access is what's difficult because it may be, we think of it in POPs, way, and it may be through four different countries, and there might be political tensions between some of those countries because that's just how logically the network is spelled out. And so that is where, um, I'm an offensive kind of player, that's what I get to do when I'm doing my own job and I'm educating on stage. Um, and so this is a, Order to be able to actually be have a clear path, mission package ready, and then to be able to execute. But guess what? That person did an update on their computer, and all of a sudden, that zero day is no longer zero day. We don't have access anymore, and the commander wants us to execute tomorrow. 
Um, so the perishability of our accesses, the perishability of our exploits are oh, crazy because the timeline is not like regular weapons acquisition. I can talk to any commander and they will know what a 556 five, round is going to do 50 meters away. But if I tell you that would take down Blackhawk's flight navigation, it may be gone tomorrow. And I might have spent $2 million developing it out because it took about two years because we had to acquire the parts from wherever it was, dev it out, figure out what an exploit would be, reverse engineer it, figure out how it's going to work, and then get access to it, be it close enough or however it is, right? Um, and so that's where it gets really complicated. So commanders that are on the ground and they have soldiers live that they're concerned about, capability that may or may not work because they may or may not have updated their systems uh, and that exploit may be gone or it may not work like it does in the training environment or our laboratory environment once it gets out to the wild because the system that's attached to it might have been updated. So it's a huge well, strategic planning. And so that's where I think it gets really complicated. And what we've seen um, in Ukraine, it's just that it's been very hard to integrate and do multi-domain operations where you have kinetic and cyber operations that truly complement each other and really well. Sometimes it's like luck of the draw. This thing works and we're going, and so let's use that today. But oftentimes that luck you win is in, in, in hand at that point. So it's less about holding things at, at risk and more about creating, constantly creating opportunities, which is where all of the wicked smart soldiers that we have come in. In my opinion. <laughs> and before we move on, the uh, Houston Astros are a bunch of cheater, cheater pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> there, there. Okay. And so, yes, the Army Cyber Institute. I know it's a sensitive area, but I think. Wow. Any mind on how silent is affecting this situation while we see the weapons or and how it might change the things that play? I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to be very provocative and say it's made me question the degree to which our, uh, however much cyber capacity has been aimed at online trolls, might have been otherwise better spent on nuclear C3. But. That's just a personal bugaboo. <laughs> I guess I've spent some literature on the inner, like on what are the implications of the interdependence on all and you know vulnerable digital infrastructure. Um, and you know there have been attempts to apply arguments about conventional escalations in nuclear weapons to the cyber domain to look at you know what are the scenarios where we might anticipate that a cyber incursion or even a cyber attack against another state's dual use warning satellites or something like that could lead to um, inadvertent nuclear escalation because the target, you know, sees, so, so the scenario plays out where, you know, you would, you'd see some cyber attack against early warning satellite and you worry that this is an indicator of um, your adversaries, uh, uh, attempt to take out your own, to conduct a, a strike to take out your own first strike nuclear forces, and then you have an incentive to use it before you lose it, right? Um, I, I think in theory, a lot of these scenarios are logically consistent and they make sense, but um, in practice, you know, picking up a lot of the points that we've all been talking about, um, yeah, for all of those things to sort of work out, um, a lot of things have to go right, and more often than not, in the real world, especially in a time of war, things don't go according to plan. Um, so it's a it's it's a scary scenario. Um, I think the probability is extraordinarily low. Um, oh, tactical news! I don't think there's a cyber dimension to well, tactical news. We're going to do it in your class on Wednesday. Oh, we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Longergood's class on the uh, Columbia on Wednesday, we're going to go over an experiment my co author is running at uh, CSIS. And uh, one of our hypotheses, and one of the most interesting aspects of cyber, is the potential for cyber to uh, provide an offering. So that if you attack 
satellites. If you attack C3, that might make the decision calculus that much different in the adversary. So I think that's something we've underestimated so far, and we're really trying to pick at that through war games. But it's obviously a tough uh, nut to crack. But th that's something I'm actually hopeful for, which is strange coming from me. But yeah, I do have hope for something. <laughs> That's like an interesting lesson. That pitch before, in regards to Putin's partial mobilization effort that occurred, have there been any findings or discoveries on your guys' ends in regards to uh, Putin and Russia's internal uh, cyber efforts or security strategies? Like Mr. Wild said, that cognitive info space perspective they have, and they tried to address their own people's. And I will just jump in to, to say, I meant to do this before, we only have around nine minutes left. Okay. So if we're, if we're fast, we can maybe squeeze in one more question. <laughs> I mean, trolling in Telegram channel is going to be a window. Um, and there's, or I don't troll because I don't post. <laughs> anyway, um, I would expect where there's lots of encouragement to support the troops, blah, 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 all of that type of stuff. Um, but there is this end, but I think we need to remember, and I think this has been inflated in the United States or in the U.S. media, is that we have to remember that Russia is pretty massive and Russia has a lot of people. And so when it's that 300,000 men have left or military age male has, has left and cross borders into other countries, like that's a drop in the bucket. Sure, it's the same number as what he was trying to mobilize. What's right now that is causing there is rumors that he's mobilized 384, which is more than what they said. And so people are confused. Um, it's, again, all of this is me passively observing and translating into English, but not much comes out from Russia because it's a pretty close old society. But there's definitely internal tension and but the overall sentiment is that they're supporting of their their troops that have to go. But it's a tension point. They it escalated beyond beyond what they thought. Um, yeah, interesting. I would add to that from a strategic perspective, you've got a mass of Western tech companies that have left or stopped servicing extant equipment. You've got an outflow of Russian passport holders from July to September of this year, numbering 10 million, going primarily to places like Kazakhstan, Georgia, Turkey, places that are thirsty for tech know-how and haven't had it for a long time, where they can possibly find good, good paying jobs in the tech sector. Um, on top of an already uh, chronic plague of brain drain, in Russia over the last 20 years. I would say all of those factors combined point to, in my mind at least, a scenario in which Russia's best days as a cyber power may, may have seen them already. I don't predict that, but I think it's a scenario that's worth considering because when you don't have Cisco, Microsoft, everyone else you name it, providing any new equipment, it's tougher to do your job. When you don't have well-trained cadres coming into the market, it's tougher to do your job. So cyber-wise, I think they're going to have a tough road to hoe in the next few years. There's an interesting narrative uh, in a lot of these channels that in 2020 or 21, Russia uh, or the U.S. sanctioned or indicted several Russian cyber actors. And I, from what I've been able to gather, they violated kind of the don't act Russia rule or they did something that was negative to the state. So about 20 one guy who was a very good hacker got rolled up, and then um, they call him Flynn. But <laughs> I, which I know, I, at first I had to do some research to make sure it wasn't that Flynn there. But um, but that what they is that they're calling for those guys to be released from prison because they see them as some of the twenty most some of their best, right? That have been rolled up because they violated some, um, they stole money or able to launder money. So that was a really interesting narrative to see that, okay, it's just 20 dudes, so they're clearly hurting for talent if they're thinking about and trying to push for guys who got rolled up in, in the... That's been for us, and uh, we've dealt with this in the Commission. How do you mobilize reserves? 
And there is this challenge of retention. That game is lost. There's, you know, you're going to train a cyber operator and they're going to get stolen by a company because they're going to get paid three to four. Just going to happen. You're going to have people and talent that separate. You have to accept that reality and figure out how to bring them back during times of need. And that's something we haven't really worked out because the same reserve structure we use for other areas isn't going to work here. There needs to be more independence and more uh, ability to kind of do whatever you want to until we really need you. But how do we mobilize those that we really need when we really need them is going to be the key question moving forward. And that's something we haven't figured out. I have, um, my question is to Dr. Valeriano. A lot of your work focuses on the fantasy of the cyber war in Russia, and or like the fantasy of the cyber war in Ukraine by Russia. Uh, my question is, how would you deconflict that with things like the Foreign Affairs article, the myth of the missing cyber war, and in general, how how do you deconflict those two opinions on either side of the spectrum of this conflict? I hate when people read my stuff better than I do. <laughs> I have too much, and I have no idea. And I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, but I, I think this is a lesson for us to kind of avoid making war a fantasy, making conflict a fantasy. And I've said this a few times, but I think people believe that cyber will be a way to sanitize war, to make it more clean. And of course, that was started in like Star Trek in the 60s. Like it's it's not a new idea, but it, it's always there. And cyber is not going to allow us to do that. It's not going to be the path we're going to take. War is always going to be dirty. War is always going to be terrible. War is always going to be horrific. And any form of technology or hybrid method isn't going to make it easy. And I think that's a lesson we have to learn from this Ukraine conflict is that there's no shortcut for war. So now what? One thing that's related to kind of what Max was saying, it's like when we rely on news reports, sometimes that can kind of add to the blame of kind of these fears. So one thing that we've been trying to do is kind of look at other sources for data. So there's the, it's called the State Service for Special Communication and Information Protection. The firm outside of Ukraine, but kind of what can we use that's not just kind of these news reports, because oftentimes those do kind of conflate these fears of the war. Kind of moving forward, how can we empirically study this in a level headed way? The, the, the myth, the cyber war article, great article. Um, very smart people wrote it. I think the thing it, it struck for me is that decisiveness depends on context. It's so contingent on what it is decisiveness tactically, strategically, on the battlefield, as far as changing political uh, trajectory. From one perspective, you could argue Russia's strategic cyber program in Ukraine has been a catastrophic failure because guess what? Ukraine still remains westward tilt. Um, however, has it proven uh, very disruptive and very difficult to deal with in Ukraine? Yes, but also it's made it more resilient. It's galvanized a whole bunch of defenses. So I think it's the, the contingency of of what you're actually trying to measure to say whether cyber has been decisive or, or impactful. And I think it's in that fog where a lot of the debate that, uh, that people try to put on a linear kind of scale, it breaks down and kind of creates um, confusion in camps where they probably don't disagree all that much, it, more on the kind of terms of measurement that they're actually looking at. I think that's a great note to end on. So, we, and we're out of time. So, let's give our panelists. A